Welcome, everyone. Uh, as you can see, the title of this talk is Publisher Parish Bibliographic Reference List in Drupal. And the QR code will take you to the Google Slides for this presentation. Uh, and same QR code. It should be picked up from the back of the room uh, if you want. Or you can go to uh, bit.ly slash publish hyphen parish hyphen DCNJ. Uh, that way, you don't have to take as many notes, and if I skip over something too fast, you can go back in the slides yourself. So, I am Michael Muzzy. I am a web developer in the central IT of Princeton University in a group called Web Development Services. I'm not too active on socials. So there's my work email if you want to email me about something. I'm not Mike on Drupal.org, just because I go by Michael, not Mike. And uh, Muzzy.com is my uh, professional web presence. So today's agenda. First, we're going to talk about just keeping it simple. You might not need this. Uh, you know, you might not need Bibsite, which Bibsite will be the bulk of this presentation, but if you've just got a few dozen presentations, maybe copy and paste, or a few dozen publications, maybe just simple copy and paste. You know, uh, this is the nicer version of the more churlish KISS principle, uh, but really, if you, as a new faculty member, you, know, you just have a couple of dozen journal articles, maybe a book, uh, you don't really need something that's sortable, click on keywords to filter them out. You, know, you probably don't need Bibsite. Uh, but if you do, you know, want, uh, and also you might be using you know, for your own paper writing, for generating citations, et cetera. You might be using uh, some sort of uh, outside uh, citation management software. Uh, EndNote has been the major player for the longest time. Uh, now, our institution, Princeton University, has a, site, uh, has a institutional license for Zotero, so that's generally what they steer people towards. And uh, you know, this is an example of the Zotero interface. Uh, full disclosure, the list of publications is AI generated, and the input is uh, give me a list of uh, publications with various reference types using fictional authors uh, and output uh, in the BibTeX export format. And so I use that for a couple of my examples. But let's say you're already maintaining your publications uh, in something like Zotero. You might just create a collection in Zotero, right click on it, create uh, a bibliography from a collection, and then just paste it right into uh, a, pay, you know, a page uh, content item right in Drupal. Now, you might want to add a little bit of structure to that at least. Like, it's going to probably paste in a string of paragraphs or a string of divs. You might instead want to transform that into an, uh, an ordered list, or an unordered list, or an ordered one. That way, screen readers, when they come across it, they'll be able to announce uh, to the visually impaired user that this is a list with 12 items and then you'd be able to switch list item, list item, list item, and then read out the bibliographic entry. Uh, also in Zotero, you can you know, maintain this as the source of truth, export it to one of the many uh, uh, import-export formats, and then bring your list of publications automatically into uh, uh, something like Bibsite and Drupal. Now, you may notice here that uh, in this uh, export here, there's a list of citation styles, and that's really the basis of uh, this ability to interchange this data 
is what's called citation style language. And it's an XML format that defines both uh, publication types uh, and then also the fields that are in those publications. And it just helps you. Uh, and there are a, uh, there's a GitHub repository of over 10,000 CSL citation styles. So you actually won't be able to browse that on GitHub because GitHub web interface has a limit of how many things in a directory you can browse. So you would have to clone that GitHub repository and then be able to look at what the, how the CSL defines things. And so uh, what usually will happen is you will have a CSL like Chicago Manual of Style, whatever, that defines the rules for how things are going to display. And then a citation processing engine will then transform that. And then something like BIPSite will allow you then to manage that transformation and enter new content. And also, you might hear me say CSL style, CSL citation style. Uh, even on the website, you'll see that because it's, it's a redundant acronym like ATM machine. So it might infuriate, infuriate some grammar purists. But uh, if you Google CSL on its own, you're not going to find what you're looking for. But if you Google CSL style, you'll instantly find uh, what we are. And on screen, I have a few common ones. Which CSL? style you use really depends on what your institution, what your department, uh, whatever you're using. Often the default is Chicago Manual of Style. You know, it's all what we, what many of us used when, you know, way back in college writing term papers. We'd be flipping through Chicago Manual of Style to see how exactly did we format that bibliography. And I think that's, you know, all these decades later, that's still uh, the common. But you know, for example, blue book, blue book law review style, if you're dealing with a lot of legal documents, legal proceedings, et cetera. You know, MLA style, you may have heard. APA style for, you know, psychology, sociology. Uh, NLM is, uh, is in heavy use in our MoBio department here. Uh, they are very much into the PubMed. Uh, PubMed is a web service uh, for storing uh, scholarly documents and they have their own ecosystem of like PubMed ID field, uh, etc. And so uh, they use the uh, NLM or National Library of Medicine style. And interestingly enough, uh, there are 57 variations of the Harvard style, such as like University of Leeds Harvard style. But ironically, those I've talked to at, uh, uh, at Harvard, like uh, Carol Ma at Harvard, I don't know, I'm sure Benji, you probably work with her yes. at all. Uh, uh, the version that they are using, which is a variation, a Harvard-specific variation of uh, Chicago Manual of Style, is not in the official repository, <laughs> which is a little bit of irony. So, all right. so. Here, so I'm going to uh, ask you all to commit this slide to memory uh, because we'll be referring to it in a couple of slides. Uh, but uh, it's a little hard to read. This is just to give you an idea that there are uh, uh, 45 document types defined in the, the, C uh, the current CSL specification. And they may not agree with other specifications like so Terra's list of, of document types, BibSite's list of document types, we'll see soon, BibTeX. And so it's the job of software like BibSite to map one to one. So you might see here, uh, art, there's article, but there's also article journal, article magazine, article newspaper. There's something called chapter here, manuscript, web page. Personal communication, post, post web law, uh, document. Now, we got 45 there. When we go into BibTeX, uh, BibTeX a common export format. You might say, wait, there's only 14 document types here. How? And so 
what you might find when you're exporting your documents as, uh, like let's say you have something that's in here like weblog post. It's going to come into your Bibtech export file as probably miscellaneous or, uh, and there are some mappings, for example, uh, in book would correspond to chapter. Uh, and so, you know, unpublished is a tricky one. Uh, and we'll mention that in a bit by showing a specific example. Uh, from, uh, and if you go into the CSL specification, you'll see these definitions for each of these document types. And so, uh, Benji, quick question. So are, are you saying that there are a lot of round, round peg square hole problems to deal with? Uh, Benji asks, is there are a lot of round, round peg square hole problems, and there are indeed. Right. And it's quite a challenge uh, uh, when you're trying to implement a practical solution. And, and Michael, is there any uh, export format that is more comprehensive? You might be thinking, oh, I'll use BibTeX for convenience. Uh, sure. That would help with the math. Uh, the question is, is there, an, is there a comprehensive export format that solves all of this? And the answer is no. I have had the most success with EndNote, EndNote XML. That seems to have the broadest number of document types. But this is a situation where practically see what data you are, see what publication types you're working at, and just see how well this import-export uh, process preserves your original data. And so with article, for example, uh, the CSL specification says that it's uh, actually not for journal articles. There's a specific thing for that, that you should actually use this article type for preprints, working papers, uh, and they say for unpublished works not widely available use manuscript. Of course, you may see with others that, well, uh, some systems might put this article type into the unpublished document type, uh, which can create a little bit of confusion you know, when you're uh, trying to implement something that works for your users in, in Bibsight. So, and I'll just talk about it. The, so, Bibsite is the successor uh, to the bibliography module, also known as Biblio, uh, also known as Drupal Scholar, and it was a huge feature of the Open Scholar Drupal distribution, which started in Drupal 6, moved on to Drupal 7. Uh, Princeton is an institution couldn't wait for the, the or, like, uh, Open Scholar spun off from being a Harvard project to being a, 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 an outside uh, project. They spun off into their own company. Uh, and we could not wait for them to come up with a Drupal 8 solution. So we decided to spin up our own Drupal distribution uh, that had many of the features of Open Scholar. And we tried to shoehorn the custom version of Biblio that Open Scholar had into our version of Bibsite, and we got about 90% of the way there. Uh, the big thing about Bibsite as opposed to Biblio, uh, it has three entity types. It's got an import-export feature. It's got view modes to view an individual entity, but it doesn't have a, dis uh, a default display uh, to be able to view the lists. Whereas Biblio, you install it, you by default get a publications page that has many of these things already set up for you, including the lists, the filtering, etc. Whereas uh, the, the Bibsite module relies on the, the content owner to, uh, or the, the site owner to set that up themselves. Now Biblio has a number of sub-modules, both bundled with the module download, but also that you can add on to it. Uh, the big things that you're going to, you, the bare minimum to activate on your system 
is the bibliography and citation module the, and the bibcite entity module. That's what's going to create those three, uh, you know, sort of content types, but sort of not. Uh, and then also you can activate the import and export module, we'll give, uh, which will allow you to bring in the EndNote XML file or bring in the uh, BibTeX file. Uh, and there are also additional uh, import export formats then that you can activate. Now I would say only activate the ones that you're using because if you have too many options to present to your users, they could get confused, which one should I choose? And you can also uh, download additional modules like one for Crossref that allows you to look up by DOI and one for PubMed that works very similar to the other import exports, but the nice thing about PubMed, if you're using that, all you have to do is enter in a one to eight digit PubMed ID. They're currently at 38 million, so it'll be a while before they reach nine digit PubMed IDs. You enter that in and it automatically populates uh, uh, everything that you need in that reference. The last one there, bibliography and citation migrate, you would only need that if you're going, if you're taking a site from, Bibli from Biblio to Bibsite. Uh, and so we use that extensively coming from Open Scholar. But now that we're done, I think we might end up uninstalling it from our system. Now, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Bibsite has three entity types. Now the big entity type is the reference entity type, and that has within it 36 reference types. And the way, in a way, it's almost like you've got 36 different content types with just this one reference section. So for example, if you are going to customize that reference type by adding a custom field, you would act, and you wanted that field to be again uh, in all of your reference types, you would have to add that to each of those reference types. Uh, it also has a contributors entity. Normally with contributors, we think of people maintaining the module, but Bibsite calls authors and editors, the people who created the publication, uh, as contributors. And then keywords is really just like a very simple free tagging system. I'm not sure why the choice was to create a separate entity for this rather than to use taxonomy, but it does keep them all self-contained and keywords can be exported when you export, use some, you know, like a format like BibTeX. So that could be why. Uh, now, when I say that they're not really standard node entities, it, in the fact that like, if you're going to go in the Drupal admin interface to, uh, to uh, content add, it's not going to show up in that menu. It's going to show up either in, uh, you know, in a sub-menu if you're using the admin bar module, or if you're not, when you go to the content page, it'll be a separate tab called bibliography, and that's where you would manage all of the tabs. Uh, you know, for for the entities and import and export. And those uh, 30, okay, here they are. Uh, yeah. Is this, so instead of 45, we're getting 36? Instead of 45, and uh, question is, are we getting, and there's definitely a number mismatch here. Uh, instead of 45, we do have, uh, now, for example, BibSite doesn't have the overall article one, it does have magazine article, journal article, and newspaper article. It has an unpublished. Uh, uh, instead of graphic, it has artwork. Uh, and so, and there's not one for post or post weblog, but there is one for website. And there's one, and so, uh, luckily, there is a configuration page in, in, in Bibsite that allows you to map, uh, uh, you know, type to type. Question. Quite sure. Suppose I have an existing Drupal site that's got thousands of articles and comments. Is there any way to use Bibsite? 
to retrofit this this site into that system. So, like, let's say I have an article that's written by an author. So it wasn't designed from the ground up to use BibSite. Can I shoehorn BibSite into this, or is that just yeah. too complicated? The question is whether if you've got an existing library of articles on a Drupal site that has its own authors, uh, could you shoehorn this into Bib, you know, shoehorn something like that into Bib site to list those out? I'd say it's a possibility. Like you could try, like if you had, if you could generate some kind of information about each article, like author, first name and last name, like the article title, and output that into a simple format like BibTeX, you could then bring BibTeX into, uh, into BibSite and then manage it that way. Uh, Benji. You, you could also use views data export to create an XML file out of it and then import that. And the comment was that you could also use uh, views data export to create an XML file, and that's 100% correct. Yes, and you just you know conform it to uh, you know one of the common XML formats for import and export. So uh, let's say you have BibSite installed. What are some of the first things that you're going to want to configure? Uh, First thing, I would the individual entity page. I would immediately change that from being viewed. Uh, you have three options there: default, citation, or table. We found it to be a little redundant to both have a citation in the list and then a citation on the individual entry page. The other thing is that the citation almost always omits the abstract, and that can be a very lengthy paragraph or a couple of paragraphs. So the idea would be you'd list the citation, someone would click through the citation to view the individual entry, and then they'd be able to read the full abstract. And uh, the table view uses tables for layout, which is not exactly accessible. The default layout is a little bit better. Uh, it, it, it's not using tables for layout, but it doesn't have any structure. It's, used, it's just using divs that are CSS, uh, that are just CSS styled to make them look bold. So you might want to then, well actually we'll talk about that in a bit, but you might want to transform those with a twig template to add some heading tags. Uh, another setting that you might want to change right away, uh, and I'll show you why in a bit, is um, over the, Interface override, override entity forms. Uh, and I'll skip back to that. Uh, just because uh, that when that checkbox is checked, the entity add page, the create page, has all of the fields very neatly arranged in these, in these vertical tabs. But you've spent a lot of time then searching for what you need Whereas, this is, these are actually two columns that are, are, are one page that's been split into two columns so you can not necessarily read the labels, but get an idea of, you know, this is a journal article, these are all the fields, and so if these have data in them, or you can see which ones have data or not data, uh, or not null data, uh, it's much easier to enter your content in this version versus the vertical tab version. So. Uh, and again, this is right out of the box what the individual entity page looks like. And again, these, uh, uh, that was one of the first things that we did was we added a custom view mode uh, that we could use uh, that made those actual heading tags. And we made you know, the external links a little prettier. And uh, another thing that you can do in the config page is turn off the external links that you're not using. For example, by default, if you have the EndNote module turned on, uh, uh, a user who visits your site can download an export file for that individual entry in one of three different EndNote formats. Maybe you just want to offer uh, 
uh, you know, the latest one. Similarly, if your publications are not on Google Scholar, you definitely want to turn off that uh, because what it's going to do is search Google Scholar for artificial intelligence for the quest of the ring and it's not going to find that publication there. All right. Also, when you install some of these uh, import export modules, it will give you a new button instead of just add, it'll uh, add reference, it'll give you populate reference and it'll just give you a text area field that allows you to paste in an individual BibTeX entry or paste in an individual EndNote entry and just very quickly fill in all the fields that you need, make changes and save. So now moving on from uh, uh, references uh, onto contributors. Uh, whenever, if you're, and especially when you do a bulk import of a whole bunch of uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, references, you're going to get a big list of contributors. And one of the things that you're going to want to do is clean up those contributors. Uh, and there is a merge command that allows you to check multiple boxes and merge them together. Just because sometimes certain sys, like Bibsite, will store the contributor's name as Alfred Newman. It'll have, or and it might have additional information about, uh, uh, you know, a title, uh, middle initial, etc. Uh, but the bibliographic display that you might have chosen from a particular CSL might display it as A.E. Newman. And when you export it, in a, you know, like BibTeX, or another system has exported it, it won't preserve that full name. And so you might get Alfred Newman, A.E. Newman, A. Newman. But you want to be able to click on Alfred Newman to get all of his publications. And so uh, what you want to do there is merge them. But you don't want to just delete them because that will remove the author from that particular reference. It won't give you the option to merge them. Uh, oh, and another thing I forgot to mention is that the reference field in or when you're editing a reference entity, the contributors are listed as authors. Uh, uh, I'm not sure why there's the inconsistency of language there. Uh, now there's a few items of frustrations that hopefully like we can go back as BIPSite contributors in the future or maybe one of the other BIPSite contributors can go in uh, and, and try to fix that because right now uh, you can, for each contributor or each author you can assign a category and a role but they don't seem to have any effect on the order that those authors show up in the citation entry. The only thing that really affects the citation order are the, the you can there's a drag field that allows you to drag one author above the other and that controls the uh, uh, the order and if you select an editor role, that will also remove that contributor from the author list in the citation and have something that will be like edited by Alfred Newman, John Smith, etc. The other thing too is that the categories are redundantly named. So in addition to just author, you also have primary author, secondary author, tertiary author, corporate author. Uh, subsidiary author, but you also have the same thing in the roles. So you could potentially have, you know, secondary tertiary author selected as uh, that role type, which is, uh, uh, it doesn't actually do anything, but it still can be very confusing for your users. Okay, so moving on to views integration. As I mentioned, out of the box, you're not going to get the list of publications that you want, but one nice thing about Bibsite is that it provides you with a special field called uh, a citation field. And so uh, if you're you know, setting up your view and instead of, you know, uh, 
you can either do format show reference, uh, which will spit out the list of citations according to whatever CSL you've defined, but it doesn't allow you to add any other fields. Whereas if you do show fields, uh, you can then add the citation field, which will spit out the full bibliographic reference, but then allow you to add some additional fields that you might like, like to be able to add a link uh, or uh, to be able to add uh, a publication year so that you can do grouping uh, or, or a field that will allow you to do and we'll uh, now this view might be a little tough to see here but uh, you know, again so here's where you would you know set the you know the fields as a setting for this very simple example I added a link to the reference a citation in the year of publication and so that, uh, and also for this, uh, you can set up much more complex filters. I just chose to add a filter by publication type. Uh, and then I'm sorting first by the year of publication, and then I'm sorting by the contributor. And the only reason I'm uh, able to sort by the contributor was that I added a, uh, the contributor relationship because otherwise I would have just had the author name field. Whereas once I had the contributor relationship, it brings in the last name and first name breakdown of and the other fields that are also associated with contributor and allows me to zero in on that sort. And another thing too is that, you know, better, you know, uh, better exposed filters is one of my favorite modules for if you, uh, you know, want, you know, the option to display all the records, for example, until a filter is actually chosen. Uh, if you're not doing a custom coded filter, that can be the best, simplest way to uh, 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 to have that work. Another question. Sure. Um, maybe you've already said this, I, must, I don't remember. If these are types of entities, are they fieldable? Can I add my own custom fields? You can. Uh, uh, the question is, you know, because these are entities, are they fieldable? Can you add custom fields? And the answer is definitely yes. And in fact, because the Biblio version of, uh, or, or the Open Scholar version of Biblio uh, had featured images, even though, cite, even though images aren't normally part of a bibliographic citation, a lot of users liked having right next to their, 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 their bibliography items, having that little thumbnail image and then having that full image on, uh, uh, on the detail page. And so, again, the downside of that, that is that you, know, you have to add that featured image 36 times. Also, uh, Many of the import export formats aren't going to be aware of that image or have a place to store that image. Uh, and so you either need to choose choose an export format. I'm not off the top of my head sure which one does support images, but you have to choose an export format that would be able to, to store that image. Uh, maybe Zotero RDF, I'm not sure. Uh, and then you would have to map that custom field to uh, that particular export format field. And then what you would get here is just, you know, again, a very simple out of the box. Uh, you, you have, uh, you know, this is just my, you know, better, expo my better exposed filter here to, for reference type. Uh, I'm sorting by year of publication. Uh, uh, and then again, I'm sorting by the last name of the, uh, the primary author. And you'll notice here that the whole thing is linked. Now one downside is that the, the, uh, the citation field is really just outputting content. And so you would have to write then a custom module to, uh, to override uh, that content, which that's something that we've done uh, the way we, we decided to do it in our, this is our, our site builder, this is Princeton's distribution. We chose to rewrite how citation outputs so that uh, it only links the title 
rather than the entire entry. Uh, the other thing that we did was we decided not to use views at all for this page output. We're writing, and so we were at, able to add some more complex filters like author, type, year, keyword, etc., and some more advanced sorting. Uh, and another thing that we did too was we are giving you, even though it's not a standard part of the citation, we uh, are using, we allow users to put the abstract right there in the citation list underneath a collapse list. And actually to avoid accessibility problems of having abstract, 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 we have an ARIA tag underneath that says abstract of artificial intelligence and clowns a review, abstract of the role of artificial intelligence in Middle Earth, et cetera, to read that out. But when they click that, that will then disclose the, uh, uh, the full abstract. So, so you can really go as simple or as complicated as you want, depending on how much custom code you want to add or how much work you want to put into the views. Uh, so I'll mention a few uh, gotchas. Uh, I mentioned that you have a citation processing engine in between your CSL and what BibSite can work on or, or what BibSite uh, uh, does. For the, in the current release versions, which is 2.0 beta 3 and 3.0 beta 3, it's using a site proc engine called Academic Puma. That version is deprecated and is not compatible with current versions of PHP. So, for example, you're spinning up a DDEV environment or you're spinning up, you know, even a simply test.me, you're probably going to get a lot of PHP errors when you try to run that. Uh, thankfully, the, the Sebastian Butger version of SitePROC uh, is in the dev version. And hopefully, there will be a new beta 4 release that will. Uh, that will fold the dev version, you know, uh, in. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you're not going to use, want to use the dev version, uh, you can use 3.0 beta 3 and apply this patch that I have linked to if you want to grab the slides. Uh, another thing that's been kind of a pain in the butt is that one of our customers still, des and we haven't been able to fix this yet, you know, one of our customers desperately wanted a more granular, they wanted their publications sorted by when it was published, not just by the year of publication. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the original maintainers of BibSite ch just chose to make that field just a why, 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 why field, just for uh, four digit year. Uh, Part of the reason for that is the Drupal core date field really doesn't have an option to do you know, variable granularity, whereas a, you, you, know, you can choose one or the other. You can choose to add the month specificity, you can choose to add the day specificity, but you can't really have very, you know, like, uh, unless we were to you know, fold in three different date values and somehow merge them together, which we may end up doing, they can't, uh, it would all, always need a value, like a zero one uh, for, uh, uh, and we don't want that to be output into the, the citation. That if something was just published generally in 1974, month unspecified, we don't want to specify that it was uh, published January uh, 1974 because that might be incorrect. And so I think one, you know, if we are able to solve that problem, that's going to make one of our users very happy to have that, uh, uh, you know, variable granularity. Uh, and uh, that's really all I have. So if I can open up to questions for these last five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, so who, who are the contributors in usual Drupal sense? 